Hello, my name is Mary Jenny. I'm Chief Investigator for the FAR RMS study and I'm delighted to be able to describe the study in some detail to you today. Um, I'm also delighted that Henry Mandeville and Julia Chisholm will be, will be working with me to, to present what is quite a complex study and we look forward to answering any questions at the end of this session um, if you have them. So the frontline, um, frontline and relaxed RMS study is exactly what it says. It's, it's an overarching study, um, including patients of all ages uh, who, present, um, who newly present frontline with rhabdomyosarcoma sarcoma or, who, uh, or in whom um, the disease recurs. And the study also takes patients with relapsed rhabdomyosarcoma, rhabdomyosarcoma, sarcoma, which Julia will focus on in her study. Before I start, I would like to acknowledge um, the very many people who have made this study and continue to make this study possible, particularly colleagues at the Clinical Trials Unit in Birmingham, um, but also those working with Quartet, which Henry will be able to describe in more detail, and other national and international colleagues who are leading various parts of the trial. Just to give you a brief overview, um, this, the trial design is that patients with newly diagnosed and relapsed rhabdomyosarcoma sarcoma will be eligible for the study. It's a multi-arm, multi-stage international study, and I will go on now to explain um, some of the details behind that. We're looking at um, randomized questions in chemotherapy um, with different subgroups, very high risk and high risk. The duration of maintenance chemotherapy for those patients who have maintenance chemotherapy, and also asking questions relating to radiotherapy trying to improve local control. One of the exciting things about the study, as I've mentioned already, is that it's open to all patients of all ages. So both newborn and, um, and patients in their 20s, 30s and 40s who might present with rhabdomyosarcoma, sarcoma, albeit rarely, uh, would be eligible to take part in any part of this study. The recruitment period will be over seven years, but we're delighted with the enthusiasm there's been internationally in the study, and we're very optimistic that we will complete recruitment in that time. The follow-up period at the moment is three years, although, as I will also tell you, we're hoping to include some um, quality of life studies, and so um, we may be following some patients up for longer. The recruitment target is 12 to 150, given that only just over 100 patients a year present in the UK with rhabdomyosarcoma, sarcoma, you can see the need for us to collaborate internationally to answer some of the questions we wish to within the study. Before I just go on to the methods of, of far MS, I just want to, um, to show you the results from our last study in rhabdomyosarcoma, sarcoma, where we um, explored um, the, the importance or otherwise of adding maintenance chemotherapy to those patients who had high risk disease. And just wanted to show you that in a randomized study that lasted, almost, that lasted again probably 10 years, we recruited patients to the blue line represents those patients who were randomized to receive maintenance chemotherapy, the red line, um, those who were randomized to receive standard th therapy and not proceed to maintenance chemotherapy. And as you can see, this is event-free survival. So these patients didn't go on to relapse or have any other significant events. And although that didn't quite reach significance, for the overall survival of these patient groups, you can see that there was, a, there was a benefit of over 10% in those patients who received maintenance chemotherapy. And that's one of the um, best evidence base we have for the backbone of our um, randomized questions we're asking going forwards. And this now has become a new standard in high-risk rhabdomyosarcoma. sarcoma. I'll come back to maintenance chemotherapy later in the talk. Rhabdomyosarcoma sarcoma is complicated, and, and I toyed with show, showing you lots of pictures of the, of, of the disease at lots of different sites, but decided in the end it was simpler just to say that we, we have low, standard, high, and very high risk um, groups of patients. You don't need to know too much detail about the subgroup, but it's worth um, recognizing that whether a child will, whether, whether the disease will respond well to chemotherapy depends on, or otherwise, and, and radiotherapy depends on a number of issues, including fusion status, which is a molecular test that we do in the rhabdomyosarcoma sarcoma cells, either positive or negative. IRS grouping, which is um, a measure of what, what of the surgery that the patient has at diagnosis. IRS one is when it's completely resected. Two is when there's a little bit of disease left. Three is when it's just a biopsy to begin with at the start of treatment. And four is metastatic disease. Um, as I've mentioned already, rhabdomyosarcoma sarcoma can occur at any site, it can occur in the, the head, the face, the limbs, the pelvis, 
and um, and so um, some of these sites we recognize as being favorable for some reason or associated with a better outcome some are unfavorable and again that can be relevant in understanding how a how a patient's disease will respond to treatment and then whether or not there are nodes present and whether or not the the tumor is large the size of the tumor and the age of the patient generally but, but the older, older 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 patients and adults have a poorer prognosis than the the younger ones i'm going to spend most of my talk on this slide in various forms because this is the uh, this is demonstrating the the um the overarching trial design so if i just briefly take you through it um Henry will take you through the radiotherapy part of this and Julie will take you through the relapse. So I will concentrate on the others. Phase 1b dose finding. This is around, the, this is this, the, the, one of the opportunities that the study provides is a platform for us to bring new drugs into um, phase 1b dose finding so that we can try, we can bring new drugs as beca they become available and have um, evidence that they may be effective in radomyosarcoma. sarcoma and use them alongside our standard drugs. So, um, and as you can see, by the way, this is, this is um, designed, we can do this both at frontline and we can bring new drugs into the relapse setting as well. So in the frontline study at the moment, we're looking at irinotecan, bringing it in combination with our standard drugs, ifosfamide, vincristine and actinomycin D. And at the moment, we've just completed the first uh, dose level at 20 milligrams and because it's shown to be safe at that level we are now testing it at 30 milligrams per meter squared alongside the other drugs. Julie will talk to you about this in more detail with respect to the relapse setting. Once we've got that dose agreed we will then be bringing it into the frontline randomization so we're adding irinotecan against in, in ifosfamide, vincristine, actinomycin D and doxorubicid for patients with very high risk disease and for uh, with um, aphosomide, vincristine, and actinomycin, comparing that to the com combination with irinotecan in high risk disease. But that's not yet open because we haven't yet found the dose of irinotecan, um, but will open in due course. So, skipping radiotherapy, as I say, leaving that to Henry, in the maintenance, um, um, for the maintenance randomizations, and I've already shown you that we have evidence that more was better in the last study, but we do not know whether more maintenance chemotherapy will lead to further improvement in this study, because there's no such thing as a free lunch, and there's that balance between more chemotherapy and the side effects of treatment versus are we going to be able to stop the disease recurring in more patients. So for patients with very high risk disease, there'll be, an, um, we're asking, does the addition of a further 12 cycles of vinorelbin and cyclophosphamide, which are the drugs used in maintenance, um, improve outcomes? when compared to the standard 12, 12 cycles of maintenance. And for high risk patients, so not quite as high a risk as the very high risk, who currently would receive seven, six cycles of vinorelbin and cyclophosphamide, does the addition of a further six for them improve outcomes? So patients will have, um, will have their, for the very high risk, they'll have their 12 months, they'll come to the end of that, they'll be randomized and to either stop treatment at that point or continue with another 12 cycles. For those with high risk, they'll have had their six, six cycles of maintenance. They'll be randomized during that final cycle to either stop or continue on with more chemotherapy. Um, and so that's one of the other randomizations we're doing. As well as the randomized, as well as, um, as, well as bringing new drugs in to try and um, test them in frontline and relapse, and doing those randomized questions frontline and in maintenance and relapse, we're also asking some other questions alongside um, our patients as they follow through. Um, specifically, an example of this is the imaging substudies. We're doing two, one with positron emission tomography and one with diffusion weighted MRI. And just to explain a little bit about what we're doing here, this is, this is a PET scan. Normally the bones would be very pale. Um, the dark areas here are just in the kidneys and the bladder as the, as the drug, as the, um, um, as the, uh, as the marker is being excreted. But as you can see, the bones are all um, hot and there's, there's, a, there's a bigger lesion here. What we're doing is we're repeating this scan after three cycles of treatment. And in this patient, you can see that the, um, the um, images have cleared, the bones have cleared, 
there's still the, there's still the um, excretion in the kidneys and the bladder um, and normal uptake in the heart and the brain. And so there's been a good response to chemotherapy, but what we don't know is whether that good response is maintained and leads to a better outcome in the long term. And that's what we're going to be able to learn more about by doing scans at the beginning and, and after three cycles, both with PET and with diffusion weighted MRI. Um, just before I finish and hand over to my, um, to my colleagues, I just want to um, mention a couple of other things. We've been delighted with the involvement of the um, EPSSG parent group that's the European Pediatric Soft Tissue Sarcoma um, um, Parent Group. Uh, they've, been in, they've been involved in many aspects of the study design and continue to be involved, and not just with reviewing documentation um, um, with the original study and more recently with the relapse study, as Julie will tell you. They've also, they're also working with us on additional communication tools with patients and are now collaborating as we, as we um, expand the quality of life questions within the study. We've also been able to rebrand the study, as you will have seen on the first slide, with a new logo, and that was um, um, a working partnership, uh, which Julia will be able to talk to you in more detail about, either in her presentation or in the questions afterwards. Um, as I've just mentioned, so we're working with, with, with our patient and, and parent group to, to further ex expand um, quality of life work within the study. Henry will talk to you about the questions that there are within the um, radiation randomizations but this platform of this um or this overarching study where we're, we're we've got so many patients within the within the clinical trial being followed up is is a really really valuable opportunity to learn more about what it is what to what extent quality of life is impacted by having um, rhabdomyosarcoma, sarcoma particularly with respect to local therapy and we want and we our ambition is to be able to extend follow-up and understand when you're treated as a very young child, perhaps with a bladder tumour, perhaps with a head tumour, perhaps with a limb tumour, what the impact on quality of life is into the long term. And so we're, set, we're working that up with our, with, um, with our colleagues and patients and parents at this moment. The other study we're exploring is a decision-making study looking at that, particularly with respect to that maintenance question, uh, how, what influences um, someone's willingness to be part of the study and um, and how can we better explain and help patients to 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 take part um, both the patients themselves and the parents who may be uh, answering that question on behalf of their children so these are the sort of um, um, issues that we're exploring going forward uh, we've opened these are the current participating countries the green are those that are open already the orange are in setup as you can see, we're pretty international, including Canada being interested in the um, relapse study and Australia opening and recruiting to the, to the um, to main study at present. And we're expecting more countries to come online imminently. And these are the centres that are open and recruiting already. So we're delighted with the enthusiasm um, and more and more colleagues wishing to join us as we go forward. So, um, and, and, just, and just briefly, the recruitment at the moment, actually, this, we've, since this slide was done, we've now got up to 73 patients recruited and over 30 to the randomised questions. So thank you very much. I'm going to hand over to my colleagues now and look forward to seeing you again shortly uh, for any questions that this has raised.